And today our focus is the Holy Spirit and the birth of the church. And uh, if you're with us and joining us online, it is so good to have you with us as well. Pray that this message speaks to your heart. But as we get started, I do also want to add to what has already been said and honor uh, Don and Hazel Cooper-Williams, who are just outstanding people and have made an incredible contribution to our church over many, many years. And I personally want to say how grateful I am for, the t to them, for them. Uh, and I want to say to Hazel, thank you for caring for my mum. As I think Sam said, you would go and care for people. And you would do it without any uh, requirement in return, but simply because that's the kind of lady that you are that you serve others, that you love others, that you show Jesus to them. And so thank you for that personally as a son. And Don, you're a great man. And for both of you, we believe there are still many, many great days ahead for you in regard to service to the Lord and to his church. So God bless you. Amen. Let's begin by reading from Acts, Acts chapter 1 and verse 1. In my former book, Theophilus, there you go, so we are writing, you are all Theoph 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 Theophili, I suppose you could be, because he's writing to Theophilus. I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and he spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard from, you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. There is something about to happen here. Something's going on, but they need to wait for it to take place. This moment of Pentecost that you may be aware of, familiar with, this time when, uh, as we read about in Acts 2, we read about the upper room moment of the Holy Spirit coming and uh, the people there in the upper room starting to speak in other tongues, a moment when this Holy Spirit of God descends in a way where they see and experience this fire can be broken into three areas. And I've brought a whiteboard up just to help out a little bit. Don't you love that? And uh, I'm going to get, this always happens every time I try and use one of these things, it struggles. Thank you. That's why you're in the boy band, Brent. You've got a reason. I don't know what Sam's reason is. <laughs> it's not his voice. <laughs> I was getting nervous when Sam started talking about the choir. And when he started going, anyone can be in the choir. I'm like, no, Sam, not anybody. God's graced us in different ways, and there's a reason for that. <laughs> All right, three things. Quite simply, uh, when it comes to this moment of Pentecost, there is a before, which could be described as preparation. All right, some of you who are university students are thinking, why did he have to bring out a whiteboard? I experienced this throughout the week, and now you're bringing it into Sunday. Sorry. That's exactly what I'm doing, but it's going to help you. And your lecturers are trying to help you. So that's what I'm trying to do today here. Then there is a during, all right? So we have a before, which is preparation. Then we have a during, which could be described as the actual outpouring, all right? And then we have simple before, during, and after. Uh, and the after uh, really could be described as purpose, uh, or pathway is another way uh, to look at it. They all kind of have a P connected to them, which just adds to the alliteration. So 
If we look at things in this way, we're now going to consider how that relates to what takes place in the birth of the early church and the power of God's Holy Spirit at work. Preparation, two things we're going to look at about preparation. Here's the thing, preparation matters. Are there any budding chefs here? Any uh, culinary kings or queens, just give us a wave if, if that's you. Uh, you know, any master chef potentials, people are pointing at others. Uh, anyone who is in that journey, on that journey, will tell you that preparation matters. Isn't that true? Now, I'm not a chef. Casey, are, are you quite a... Preparation is important. If you don't get preparation right, you're not going to get the food right. Preparation matters. Now, if you're a fisherman, any fisherman here, I am not a fisherman. Any fisherman will tell you, and this is probably where I get it wrong, any fisherman will tell you pre preparation matters. That's probably why I get it wrong, because I just like want it all to happen straight away, just throw the hook in and hopefully a fish turns up. But they prepare. Like, I know friends, I've talked about Sam, he's into fishing, he, he has these like apps, you know, that tell you what's going on. I'm like, that is the most boring thing on the planet. <laughs> but someone creates apps so you can be prepared for when the fish are running and you can know the tides and you can know the currents and you can know the, everything that's going on so you can be right there at the right moment for the fish. This is weird. Preparation matters if you want to catch fish. Preparation matters if you're an athlete. Who are the athletes in the room? Just, I mean, I mean, let's all put up our hands. I mean, honestly, we're all athletes in one way or the other. And we all know if you're an athlete, preparation matters, doesn't it? You want to succeed in whatever your discipline is. Guess what? There are often years of preparation that takes place. Well, there was a preparation before the Holy Spirit came. In Acts chapter 1, verse 4, we read, but wait here for the gift my Father promised. Two things. The first thing about preparation is, number one, there was a time of waiting. There is something about the work of the Holy Spirit that requires waiting. We don't like waiting. We don't live in a world that appreciates waiting. We live in a world that is about immediate Immediate self-gratification. We want everything. We want it now. And yet here we read that Jesus said, go to Jerusalem and wait for this gift from the Father. They, they don't know what it is and they don't know how long they're going to have to wait. But they have to wait. Preparation requires waiting. In our journey of faith, there are times of waiting. It's not on our time, it's on God's time. Let me read this story uh, about someone who I'm sure you will understand uh, as a great revivalist. It begins in 1878 in Lahore, I think, in South Wales. Hannah Roberts gave birth to the ninth of her 14 children. Wow. Yep, that's a double wow. A son named Evan. Her husband, Henry, was a coal miner and they did not have a television. <laughs> so anyway, moving along. It was inevitable that their son left school early and at the age of 12 joined his father at the coal faith. Face, faith, faith. He was a man of faith, but he was at the coal face. As he grew up, he was considered by many to be a non-entity. Isn't that encouraging? What are you, a non-entity? Inadequately educated, shy, retiring by nature. However, this non-entity became a Christian. And inspired by Thomas's absence from the upper room, the impressionable young lad vowed that he would never be absent from such meeting and that he would always wait and pray faithfully for the coming of the Holy Spirit. Consequently, in about 1893, when he was 14, he started praying for revival. And as John Peters writes, 
Once convinced of Wales' need for revival, he prayed unceasingly for over 11 years. He waited and prayed for 11 years for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit and a revival swept over Wales in 1904 and 1905 in which about 100,000 men or women and women became Christians because a 14-year-old boy prayed for 11 years. See, I call this kind of waiting prayerful patience prayerful patience. It's not waiting without purpose. It's not waiting just hoping. It's waiting with anticipation. It's waiting with belief. It's waiting with faith. And Evan Roberts kept on praying, not for one year, not for two years, not for five years, but he kept on praying for 14 years. And there was an outpouring of God that we still hear of and talk about today, known as the Welsh Revival. But it didn't happen because they joined a prayer group for a couple of weeks. They waited and they kept waiting. You think about how he could have given up. You think about how difficult life would have been for him. He was not someone who had a lot going for him. He's just kind of going about life as best as he can. He could have got distracted. He could have got frustrated. He could have given up. He could have wanted things on his terms, but he kept waiting with patient prayer. The disciples didn't know how long they would have to wait. Evan Roberts didn't know how long he would have to wait, but he was prepared to wait. And he was prepared to pray with patience that God would move. Jesus said, wait, because there's a gift from the Holy Spirit coming. Are you prepared to wait? Have you given up waiting? Have you got prayerful patience? When I was a teenage boy, I actually uh, believed that maybe God could use me. And I remember in about grade 10 of high school, I decided that I would pray for my school. Evan Roberts prayed for a nation. Well, I just prayed for my high school. And I'd get up early, literally, and we had this room down in the basement of our house where we were living. And I would go down there and I would pray every day. I'd pray for my school. Pray that God would do something. It was a state school. There was not much happening. I was in a little Christian group at the school with a, maybe seven, eight people, and I prayed, and I prayed for my friends. I prayed that Jesus would do something in my school. And I kept on praying. And I continued at that school into grade 11, and I kept on praying. And not much really happened. And then I moved schools and I went to Castle Hill High School. Castle. And when I left, I think maybe one or two of my friends had come to church. Maybe one of them, I think, had given his life to Jesus. But I'd got up early every morning, I'd kept getting up early, I'd kept praying. I'd kept believing that God wanted to do something in my high school. But I didn't see it happen. And then a number of years later, when I'm now a youth pastor serving in our church here, I think I was involved with Youth Alive, which was a gathering of all kinds of youth groups to reach young people across the state. And I was at an event and some young people came up to me and they said, did you go to, it was Blacksland High School, did you go to that high school? And I said, yeah, I did. And they said, oh, we thought so. And they said, well, we wanted to tell you what's happening there. They said there's a revival that's broken out. Can you believe it? They said we, we, we used to have a lunchtime group and it outgrew the school classroom and now we have that group in the school sports hall because there are over a hundred students, I think even more, like something like you would not expect, couldn't believe was happening in that state high school. And they're like, we just wanted to tell you about it because we know you went to that school. And right then the Holy Spirit said to me, your prayers, your prayers, a part of what is happening today. 
Will you wait and pray patiently? See, here's a thought today I put in my notes. Church is not a place that meets all your needs, but it is a place that points me to the one who can meet them and teaches me patience in the process. Secondly, when it comes to the before, the preparation is unity, a time of unity. In Acts chapter 2, verse 1, we read that when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. In some translations say, it says they were in one accord. There was a spirit of unity. They weren't just in a place together. They were unified in heart and in spirit. And suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. They were all together and God moved. Here's the thing. We don't know all their names. We don't know the names of everybody who was in that upper room. We don't exactly know what happened. We don't know the prayer that they prayed. We don't know if anyone was preaching or giving a devotion at the time. We don't know what songs they were singing. Here's the thing, because it wasn't about someone's individual brilliance. Yes, we read about Peter's preaching afterwards, but in this moment when the Holy Spirit come, there are no names recorded of who was saying what, because it wasn't about an individual. It was about a collective who were unified and all about waiting on Jesus to do something fresh in their midst. It wasn't about who's doing this and who's doing that. I guarantee if there'd been a prayer that had been prayed and written down, everyone would be quoting that prayer today. But the Holy Spirit of God didn't want it that way. He just wanted them in unity. Because where there was real unity, where that Spirit of God had knit their hearts together, the presence of God could fall in a way that had never happened before. It reminds me of a statement we often say about our church. Hillsong Church is not built on the gifts and talents of a few, but the sacrifice of many. That has always been what our church has been built upon, that there are many unsung heroes in our church. There are many who have sacrificed and given and, and uh, deserve to be celebrated, but they're not in it for, to be celebrated. They're just in it with hearts knit together saying, God, would you do something special? Would you do something powerful? Would you do something significant? Would you do something through us? See, if we are to get stronger, we need to go deeper in our commitment to unity. Here's a thought. Unity is a choice of the heart. The enemy's plan is always to divide and conquer. That's why Jesus prayed that we would be one as he, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one. Let's look at this prayer in John 17, verse 20. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you in me and I am in you, may they also in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I've given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Unity is something so powerful. And it means dealing with what's going on in our hearts. It means dealing with things that cause separation and division, because that's where the enemy operates, always operates in that place. And we have to protect our hearts and deal with that because it's where a spirit of unity is that there is a blessing and where God's power comes in a way we have never known. Amen. Part two, outpouring. So we've considered there was a preparation and two things about that preparation was waiting with prayerful patience. And secondly, as you wait with prayerful patience, I believe God starts to deal with things in your heart. You start to deal with what's inside of you so that you can be unified. Because if I consider these early disciples, they weren't always in unity. 
I mean, you had moments where they were fighting with each other about who's the best. You had the mother of two of the brothers going up to Jesus and saying, hey, Jesus, can my boys be the top dogs around here? You had all kinds of arguments and all kinds of challenges and issues going on amongst this crazy group. And yet, somehow the Holy Spirit was working in them to unify their hearts and spirits. In the waiting and the patient prayer, God deals with your heart. Three, two things about outpouring. Let's read Acts 1 verse 8. It says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. What do we understand about an outpouring? Two things. Number one, it was a time of receiving. You will receive power. Power, this Greek word, is dunamis. The definition is strength. Ability, power presiding within you, moral power, excellence of soul. It also talks about potential power, power that is not yet utilised, not yet realised, latent power. This power of the Holy Spirit that is placed in you but is for a deeper purpose. Here's the thing, to receive that power there needs to be room. I got a luggage bag here. But if I want to fill this bag with something, then there needs to be room. It's just a simple example. Because I went to Castle Hill High School. <laughs> but if I want to put some things in this bag, I got to pull some things out of it. Oh, if I want to receive from the Holy Spirit, then I've got to deal with things that may be stopping room or not allowing room for the Holy Spirit. If there's bitterness, if there's anger, all these different things that can make their way so easily into my heart. And as they start to make their way into my heart, they fill my heart up with things that do not allow the Holy Spirit room to do what he wants to do. So why does this preparation matter? Well, we, we see that preparation matters because if you want to receive from the Holy Spirit, you've got to start to deal with some of these things in your heart because that's where there's room. See, something I, I wrote in my notes is I'll always make room for what's valuable to my life. I'll always make room. And sadly, if self is valuable, then self's right there. And self tends to get me a little lazy. Self tends to get me filled with pride. And so there's a process for the Holy Spirit to deal with us. There's a process for God to deal with our hearts before he can pour what he wants to inside of us. Now, I understand that none of us are going to be perfect when we receive the Holy Spirit. But if we want to make room for the Holy Spirit of God, then we have to be people who, make, who deal with some of these different things. See, the Greek word for Holy Spirit is paraclete which means advocate or helper, one who comes alongside so that you don't have to do this life on your own. You don't have to face the battles on your own. You don't have to deal with the challenges on your own. The Holy Spirit of God is poured into you so that you can begin to understand with godly wisdom how to deal with all the different challenges and issues that we all face in life. You weren't designed to do it on your own. Why Jesus said, just wait here. Just, just wait, prepare your hearts, get yourselves ready because the Holy Spirit is going to change the game. But you've got to make room. The second thing we learn about the outpouring is the outpouring is a time of beginnings. 
a time of something new. Something new was taking place that had never happened across the earth before. The the Holy Spirit of God had never been released across the earth like was about to happen. This was something brand new. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there are, there are what is referred to uh, kind of, you know, in the Bible theolo- theologically as different likes, things that are likes and types. And on the 50th day after the Passover in Egypt was when Moses received the law on Mount Sinai. Okay, so 50 days after the Passover in Egypt, Moses received the law on Mount Sinai. And this ultimately marked for them, for God's people, God giving to his people, his redeemed people, the way of life to which they could now carry out his purpose. 50 days after the Passover, Moses goes up to Mount Sinai and receives the law, which says, okay, here is something new. And like Moses' ascension on Mount Sinai, Jesus ascended to heaven. But instead of returning with the law on stone tablets, the Holy Spirit came. So no longer was it the law that you had to deal with and and try and work out how to have that uh, to get to God. You now had the Holy Spirit because Jesus had fulfilled the law and now you and I can live in the power of the Holy Spirit of God in a way that was never ever known or experienced before this dynamic energy designed to be written on human hearts, the law written on stone tablets, the energy of the Holy Spirit written on human hearts. This was brand new, prophesied years before by the prophet Joel in Acts 2 verse 17. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on who? On all people. Not on some people, not on a chosen few people, on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. The Holy Spirit of God at work. Acts 2, 17, as we just read it, is on all people. The presence of God was no longer for just a few, like Moses going up to Mount Sinai, but now it was available for all who seek and ask. And I believe God is doing something new and fresh in our church, a new beginning, but it is up to us to seek after him, to ask for it, to prepare our hearts, to be unified in spirit, to be ready so we can receive what he wants to pour into us. Something new was happening through the Holy Spirit, the birth of the church. As one theologian describes it, Judaism held three great uh, pilgrimage festivals, the Passover, Pentecost, and the Festival of Tabernacles. These three were based not only on the agricultural rhythms of the year, but also they served to tell the story of Israel's salvation. Israel was rescued from Egypt, that's the Passover. Israel met God at Mount Sinai, that's Pentecost. And then Israel wandered into the wilderness, that's the tabernacles. The festivals provided an opportunity to reflect on each of these steps. But the agricultural cycles were in play as well, the start of springtime or harvest. At the end of the cereal harvest was the second Uh, the second, which is firstly Pentecost, uh, sorry, firstly Passover, then Pentecost, and then the harvest of tree and vine, uh, which is the final, the Feast of Tabernacles. If the Jewish Feast of Pentecost was emerging in New Testament times as the occasion to recall the birth of Israel's covenant life under the law for the church, Pentecost became the day on which to recall the birth of the church under the power of the Spirit. There was the law, but now there's the Spirit. As Israel was born on Pentecost, so too the church was born on Pentecost, inasmuch as it received the endowment that would empower its ongoing life. 
the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost in a way that endorsed this new beginning of the church under the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, no longer bound to the law, but free to embrace this new presence and power of God that would bring this expression of God that would impact the earth in a way that had never happened before. This year, we've been talking about the year of the Lord's favor, which includes new beginnings through rest and restoration. God's Holy Spirit is always doing new things. This is a season, I believe, of new things and new beginnings for our church. This is a time for us to say, God, you are doing something fresh and something new. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. And in this season of June, as I say, preparing for Hillsong Conference, I believe is a time for us to prepare our hearts for the new things God is doing. Our giving at Heart for the House is a time for us to prepare our hearts for the new thing God is doing. To say, God, we are ready for your Holy Spirit to move in a fresh way. Jesus said it like this in Matthew 9, 17. Neither do people pour new wine into old wineskins. If they do, the skins will burst. The wine will run out and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins and both are preserved. Are we ready for God to continue to work in the way that he does? And that is to do new things amongst us. Because Jesus said, hey, there's new wine coming. There's always something new that God is doing. Are we prepared to adjust ourselves to be ready for the new thing that he wants to do? See, new wine is not necessarily smooth. It's unpredictable. It can be uncomfortable, but it's powerful. The old way cannot contain the new thing that God is constantly wanting to do. And we've got to allow ourselves to say, God, as you are doing something new, my heart and my spirit is ready for that. This outpouring is where the power becomes real. God moves in fresh ways. It's exciting. You've got to hold on and go with it. The early church, you read the book of Acts. Can I just remind you it's called the book of Acts, not the book of feelings. Some people think the Holy Spirit is about how I feel. It has nothing to do with how you feel. It has a whole lot to do with how you're going to act because the Holy Spirit is at work inside of you. And as you see this outworking in the book of Acts, it is amazing what God does through his people, just acting according to the power of the Holy Spirit, whether they felt like it or not. They just moved with the presence of God. And some of them experienced all kinds of challenge and difficulty and persecution. Why? Because they were acting according to the Holy Spirit. It didn't feel good, but it was what was right and necessary. The Holy Spirit at work. Finally, number three, as we read after Purpose Pathway, let's read Acts 2.42. It says, They devoted themselves to the Holy Spirit teaching and to fellowship to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved, two things that happened in regard to purpose and a pathway. Number one, it became a time of giving. We've received an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and now our purpose is to give out of that. Pentecost for the first century Jew was an agricultural festival, as I mentioned, the 50th day after the Passover, where farmers would bring in the first sheaf of wheat to bring gratitude to God, And as a prayer for blessing over the rest of the harvest, God, we are giving into you. We are honoring you. Father God, the Father gave Jesus as a seed offering at the cross. The Father gave Jesus as a seed offering. And then we reap the Holy Spirit at the day of Pentecost. This now becomes our practice to live as givers because all that has been given to us. I believe the Holy Spirit stirs a heart and a spirit of generosity. 
We read that they gave as people had need. They built the early church through generosity. Our church has been built through generosity, through people who have heard and have been obedient to the voice of the Holy Spirit. And I pray that it will continue. I want my heart to be continually stirred in obedience to God. I want it to be stirred because I want to honor God. I want it to be stirred and I want to give because I understand the principle of sowing and reaping. I want, to, I want to sow and I want to give because I want to make room for the more that God wants to do. As I conclude, the worship team can come join me. Many years ago when I was just a student at the University of Western Sydney, one of the finest tertiary education, edu anyway, um, <laughs> places in the land. I got a job out in Galston picking apples at the farm of the Rumsey family. Still have members of their family in church today. And we would pick apples and we'd get paid in cash at the end of the day. My brother was working with me occasionally. We're in different areas. I'd look for where he was. I'd take one apple that wasn't so ripe, <laughs> lob it in his direction. And if I heard a certain sound, I knew. <laughs> yes, right on target. Only to receive an abundance. <laughs> the principle of sowing and reaping <laughs> was at work. But I remember at the end of the day receiving cash for the work that we'd done, been hot, hard work. And there was a guy who'd been working there. I can't really remember that much about him. But uh, he was doing missionary work. He was an Indian guy and he was going, he was kind of helping just to earn a bit of extra cash. And I drove him back home to where he was staying I think it could have even been at the, the Van Heels house. In my 1977 green metallic Corolla. <laughs> More show than go, let me tell you that. <laughs> and he started telling me on the drive down to where he was staying, a little bit of what he was doing and his heart to make a difference. I remember as we got to where he was staying, I just knew God was speaking to my heart. And I wished he wasn't, because I needed that cash. I had to pay for petrol. <laughs> wasn't sure whether I'd make it back home. I just knew God was speaking to my heart and say, give it to him. And as he's just about to get out of the car, I reached into my pocket, I handed him that cash said, I just think I should give this to you for the work that you're doing. He kind of looked at it and he knew we'd been out all day and it'd been hard work. I said, just take it before I think about this too much, all right? Get out of the car. <laughs> he took the cash, said, thank you, closed the door. I don't actually know what happened with the work that he was doing. I'd love to say, well, he went on and led hundreds of thousands to Jesus and his name's Reinhard Bonnke. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It wasn't about what he did. It was about my obedience to an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that had challenged me now to live my life with purpose that my money, that my gifts, that my resource, that everything that I had was not my own. So it's a time of giving and finally it's a time of expansion. Again in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 it says, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And my story is one. as is the story of many of you. We're saying, Holy Spirit, work in my life. And I remember when I was at university 
and I'd be in church and I'm thinking about my future and I'm thinking about going into finishing my business degree and going to work in a corporate firm and was on the journey towards a graduate program. And I remember hearing a preacher say, hey, how long are the best minds? Gonna to go to IBM and Coca-Cola and big multinational companies. When are some of the best minds gonna to go to build the church? And it was a throwaway line. And probably it didn't hit anyone, but it hit me. And I thought, yeah, when will those great minds go? Well, if they won't, maybe I'll have a go. Maybe I'll give the best of what I have to build the church. Maybe that's the thing, God, you're calling me to, to be part of seeing your kingdom, your church expand across the earth. And I just finished my degree and I was trying to find a job and none of it was seeming to work out. And then we started this internship at church and I went to Donna and said, Donna, I'll get involved. Donna Crouch, who was our youth pastor at the time, and I said, I'll be part of the internship. Don't even know what it was. None of us did it. It all just started right then. Do Bible college as part of it. Work Thursday nights, Saturdays. Country Road at Castle Towers, actually. I do what I could. God took me on a journey. God takes you on a journey. And it led me to South Africa. It led me to a youth ministry here and a whole lot of young people. Then it led me to South Africa with my wife and with my kids to, to see the church continue to expand there. And right now it's brought me back here. And I don't want to see God's church Limit it. I don't want to see God's church stop from being what it is called to be, the powerful force for good, for, for the effective gospel, good news at work across the earth. I want to be part of seeing that expand. Whatever pain our story involves, whatever brokenness along the way, I want to keep dealing with my heart and saying, God, could you continue to use me to help build your church, to be a part of what you are doing? Because there's a purpose to my life. There's a purpose to yours. There's a pathway that God has for us. And I wanna keep walking in that because the Holy Spirit of God has come upon you and me as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ for a deep purpose to see His church established and growing and flourishing right across the earth. And that is what I've given my heart and life to. And I pray together we would give our hearts and our lives to that kind of mission. We'd see the Spirit of God continue to move in ways like we have never known. Because when the Holy Spirit is at the center of the church, let me tell you, anything is possible. God can do and will do miracles. Come on, would you stand with me? And these guys are gonna lead us in worship and then we're gonna pray. We need a fresh wind, the fragrance of heaven, pour your spirit out, pour your spirit out. Come on church, would you sing? A holy anointing, the power of your presence, pour your spirit out.
Amen. Can we just have everyone bow their heads and close their eyes? I wanna take a moment and pray with people here. I love to pray with people who say, you know what, Phil, I've been away from God. I haven't been living for Him, but I don't wanna live like that anymore. I, I wanna step into a real relationship with God. That begins with a simple prayer, a prayer of surrender, a prayer that says, Jesus, forgive me. Give me a brand new start. And I believe that's exactly what He'll do for you today. Maybe at one point you're following God, but you've kind of gone your own path. You know you need to get back into right relationship with Him today. If that's you, it would be my privilege to pray with you. So here's what I'm gonna do here online at any of our locations. I'm gonna to count to three. When I get to three, if you wanna be part of this prayer, step into a brand new relationship with God today, then you lift your hand when I get to three, and then we're gonna to pray together right where you're standing. One, God loves you. Two, have the courage to say yes to Him today. Three, just lift your hand wherever you are. Say, that's me, that's me, thank you, thank you. God bless you, God bless you, thank you, wonderful. Thank you, there's hands raised around the auditorium. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. Wonderful, God's speaking to your heart. I just believe, you know what, there are some people, God's speaking to you. I talked about making room for God, I talked about making room for the Holy Spirit. And some of you, this is that moment where you say, God, I'm giving, I'm, I'm giving things over to you, I need to make room for you. Jesus, I need to make this decision for you today. If that's you, you lift your hand. We're gonna pray for you. The Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart today. Beautiful. Amen. Those of you whose hands raised, we're gonna pray. I believe this is a fresh moment for you, the beginning of something brand new. As Jesus forgives you, gives you a brand new start. We're gonna pray this simple prayer. And you just repeat it after me. And as a church family, we're all gonna pray it together. Dear Heavenly Father. Dear Heavenly Father. Thank you for your Son, Jesus. Thank you for your Son, Jesus. Thank you for everything He's done for me. Thank you for everything He's done for me. And right now, right now I, open my heart I open my heart and my life, and my life everything, I am, everything I am, and I give it to you. I thank you. From this moment, I am forgiven. I'm a child of God. I'm leaving the past behind, and I'm walking forward into my future with Jesus as my Lord as my Saviour, as my friend, amen. Come on, let's congratulate everybody, well done. And uh, hey, if you prayed that prayer at any one of our locations or online, we just wanna say well done. That is the beginning of something so special and brand new in your walk and your relationship with God. And we believe in that decision so much, we'd love to give you a gift. Just like this, I'm holding in my hand. It's a New Testament of the Word of God. It starts with the story of Jesus. And it's a New Living Translation. It's a really easy one to read. And so as you leave, we'll have people with these. Uh, why don't you grab one and say, hey, I prayed that prayer. This is the beginning of something brand new for me. And grab that Bible. Uh, and if you don't have a Bible, you've come to church, you don't have a Bible, you can grab one as well, because we wanna give you one. We don't want you to go home without you know, having the Word of God accessible to you, because we believe it's foundational for our lives to move forward. And hey, if you're online and you prayed that prayer, please let us know in the chat and we'll send something to you to help you also on your journey of walking forward in relationship with Jesus. So come on, can we again congratulate every person who prayed that prayer?